Hello again. This is part two of developing research instruments. Um, now we're going to talk about observational checklists. So you would use an observational checklist if you are observing your participants in a natural setting. Um, so for example, um, I have a student in one of my morning classes who's uh, question or she's investigating the effects that playing video games has on the behavior of you know a toddler um, and she decided to investigate this because she's noticed that her nephew acts differently when he plays a, a video game that could be considered a little more on the violent side um, so what she's going to do is observe her nephew playing an educational game and keep track of his behaviors and then observe him playing that game that's a little bit more violent and see how his behavior compares between the two. Um, so this would be considered um, a quantitative study because she will be checking off um, how often or how many times she observes a certain behavior, or how long that behavior lasts. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it would still be considered quantitative in that sense. So again, with an observational checklist, you're going to be observing participants in a natural setting. Um, in order to, um, to create the observational checklist, you first have to decide what um, behaviors you're going to potentially observe. Um, so these behaviors are going to you know, be behaviors that you probably read about in your articles. So you're just not going to come up with anything. Um, you're going to use the research that you did for your literature review to inform the decisions that you're going to make about your research instruments. And this really goes for any research instrument. Uh, same thing with a survey. If you're trying to determine people's attitudes toward, um, toward, let's say, their feelings about the effect that gang violence has on their day-to-day -day life, you're going to create statements and questions that connect to some of the things that you've read about in your articles. So you, start to see if the data that you collect, or I guess you start to see how the data you collect compares to what you've read about um, in your research. So continuing on. After you identify and define the behaviors that you will potentially observe, you should probably group your related behaviors together. So um, you know, in, in the case of my student who I have in, in fourth period, she will probably group the behaviors together that would be considered positive behaviors and then group together the negative behaviors. You also need to decide how your observations are going to be recorded. So are you interested in um, recording the frequency, um, the frequency by which every behavior occurs? Are you interested in recording the duration of each uh, behavior? Are you interested in recording the intensity of the behavior? These are decisions that you need to make before the observation so you know exactly what you're looking for. Um, and then you also need to decide how long your observation will last. So is it just going to be for you know, 30 minutes or are you going to complete multiple observations over multiple days? So here is an observational checklist. I'll show you actually a couple. Um, and this is one that I did for grad school where I was investigating how different approaches to teaching the research paper affect motivation and engagement in students. So um, part of my data collection involved observing my students' behavior in the classroom. Um, so you'll notice here at the top I have a place to record the date and time of the observation so that you know, it's important record keeping information for you. Um, and then also the setting. So I was observing students who were working independently, who were, um, you know, listening to a lecture and also were working in groups. So that might be something that you need to define as well, the specific environment in which the observation is taking place. Um, so then along the right hand side here, you can see the behaviors that I have identified and I've grouped together the more negative behaviors at the top and then the remaining behaviors are the positive behaviors. So I decided that I wanted to record the frequency of these behaviors. It, it didn't matter to me how long they lasted or the intensity. I just wanted to know how often somebody you know, had their head down. Um, and I decided I also wanted to be able to differentiate between students. So what I created was a seating chart. And if I noticed a student was 
um, you know, exchanging ideas. I'd, I'd write the code for that particular behavior, and then if I saw that happen again for that particular student, I would make a check mark. So this this was the method that I had developed for myself. Um, the the important thing is whatever record keeping method you've developed, it's something that makes sense for you. Um, this that I'll show you right here is an earlier version of this um, observational checklist where I was going to uh, just check in general how often I saw these different behaviors. And notice again, I've, I've grouped behaviors together. I've even uh, divided them according to the type of engagement, whether it's behavioral or cognitive. Um, but then again, I, I decided later that I wanted to be able to um, you know, to see which students were were dis, um, displaying which types of behavior. So that's why I went to the seating chart method. So again, it, it might take a couple drafts to, to figure out an observational checklist that works best for you, but the important thing is that you develop something that works best for you. Okay. So other things to consider now that we've talked about surveys, interviews, and observational checklists. Um, one thing that you want to make sure you ensure with your research instrument is reliability. And this, for the most part, will pertain to surveys um, for, for the type of, type of project that you guys are doing. So one thing that you can do with your surveys to ensure reliability is include reverse items. So let me show you, whoop, let me show you an example of that. We're going back to the Likert scale survey that we looked at before. Um, and numbers 11 and 14 are reverse items. So number 11, on research papers, I complete more than the required amount of work. Number 14, on research papers, I complete less than the required amount of work. So if somebody were to strongly agree that they complete more than the required amount of work, they should probably strongly disagree that they complete less than the required amount of work. So if you notice that somebody has answered strongly disagree to both of these responses, then that could be an indication that they didn't read the statements carefully or maybe they weren't taking the survey seriously and you may want to seriously consider throwing that survey out and not including it in your data set because it could compromise the reliability of your data. Another example or another thing that you can do to ensure reliability is to avoid biased or leading questions. So, um, and this is something that I'll keep an eye out for when I, when I take a look at your research instruments on Friday. Um, you don't want to write a question or a statement in such a way that it, it doesn't allow for the participants to answer truthfully, whether, you know, it doesn't allow for multiple responses or if the question or statement has been worded in such a way that it, it tempts your participant to maybe make themselves appear to be different than, than what they really are. So, you know, if, if, you've, if you've phrased a question or a, a statement in such a way that it sounds negative, you know, it, where the participant might think it reflects badly on them if they were to answer a certain way, then they might make themselves appear to be better or different than they really are. So, um, you don't want to infer any type of judgment in the way that you've written your questions or statements because then your participants um, are, may not answer, answer as truthfully as, as they should. Um, other things to consider, you may want to include a demographic section, uh, especially for surveys. And this is important if you, you know, if you are interested in comparing how different groups of people respond. So, for example, if you were interested in seeing if males and females responded differently or if different age groups responded differently, then it would be important to have a demographic section so you could group the data later on. Um, the other thing is, and this will, you know, kind of goes along with um, ensuring confidentiality, which I've neglected to include here. Uh, <laughs> you want to make sure that your participants feel safe in answering truthfully. Um, and that means that you're promising them that their responses will not go beyond you. They will remain just between you and your participant. So 
especially for surveys, you're, you're probably going to want to allow your participants to answer anonymously. So that's where that demographic section can be really handy, um, where you're not necessarily able to, um, to match the responses to a specific participant, but you do have enough identifying information that you can group that data appropriately if you need to. Another thing to include or to consider, they may want to include a few open-ended questions on a survey. So this would be the equivalent of a follow-up question on an interview where you may want to ask your participant to explain or provide some examples. Now, I do caution you that, that you would want to be limited in how many questions you included that were open-ended. Because um, remember, if you need to have at least 50 surveys, one open-ended question on each of those surveys means that you're reading 50 written responses. So one thing to kind of keep in mind is you can use those multiple choice um, items on, on surveys to take the place of some open-ended questions. So for example, let's say you were, um, if you wanted to know what types of music people listen to, rather than just ask an open-ended question, allow them to write in, give them a list of music genres and ask them to check all that apply and then leave a box open at the bottom where they can write in any choices that maybe you didn't give them ahead of time. So that way you're limiting their responses or at least giving, giving yourself a little bit more structure as you're counting up data. Uh, the last thing to consider is to make sure that you have clear directions. Um, as you saw, all the directions for the surveys that you saw were clear and then having that script, whether you know for both the interviews and the surveys are going to help with directions. You also want to make sure the formatting, especially of your survey, is clear so um, participants know exactly, you know, it's easy to follow. They're, they're not wondering um, how to answer a specific question. It, it's, it's not confusing, basically. And you can, you know, once you create your survey, you can give it to a friend and have them take it or give it to your parents or whoever um, and have them take a look at it and give you some feedback about, about the formatting. So that is basically it. Um, remember that all of this information is available on our JT Learn page. So if you go to last week on the 7th, click on Research Instruments. Here you will see the blank note sheet that I gave you in class today, which corresponds with the PowerPoint that you just watched. Um, here is a document that includes a bunch of example research instruments and there are more example research instruments. If you go to our research project document library um, and you click on this observational checklist example and here's that script that I showed earlier um, and here again is that document with the research instrument examples. So everything is here for you. Here's that PowerPoint as well. Um, let me know if you have questions and that is all. So thank you for listening.